Hi, this is James Joachim, host of Webcomics Reviews and Interviews. Tonight, we're looking at fighting styles, so sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Interestingly enough, a lot of writers tend to not worry too much about how their characters fight. This, of course, is obviously a problem. That is, how a character fight helps to define a lot about that character's personality. You know, if we're looking at, say, a wrestler versus a martial artist, we're talking to somebody who's much more bombastic, much more aggressive, much more in your face, versus somebody who's, well, obviously a lot more reserved, a lot more thinking, and generally tends to want to get into and out of combat as quickly as possible. And this doesn't just work with fighting style. This also is how this also applies to weapons and armor. A person who goes around in really thick armor is going to be a lot more stuffy, a lot more stodgy, a lot more well closed off than somebody who goes around in a suit, you know, in a loincloth who's going to be a lot more expressive and is going to be a lot more, yeah, you're going to be able to tell what that person is thinking and they're going to have absolutely no problem telling you. And this applies to weapons as well. I mean, we tend to have various assumptions based on the character's armament. A swordsman, for example, is going to be seen as much more dashing, much more honorable than, say, somebody who goes like their daggers. Who, of course, we're going to be seeing as more of a sneaky, dishonorable type versus, say, a sniper person who's more worried about being, well, who's going to distance themselves from battle. Let's get real. That's what a sniper does. But that defines three separate different types of people. This isn't just a character personality issue. This is also has a more practical function. That is, we're looking at character design here, and that's something the artist is going to be worried about. Sure, we can have situations where basically the artist is not just going to be worried about the design of those weapons, but also where these armor, these armors and weapons are kept on a more well, how do you carry them from battle to battle? Sure, you can come up with hammer space. You know, that thing in anime where somebody is totally unarmed. They reach back and come back with a big, huge hammer. Or we can do have lightsabers. You know, cute little cylindrical rod, flick a switch, goes into a big blade. Out of combat, flick the switch, put it on your belt. Easy peasy. However, most weapons are not like that. We need to worry about where they're kept and where they are in the person. It's just something that's going to be... Uh, artists is, are going to be worried about that. They're not going to be worried about just how the person looks in battle, but also how the person stores this gear afterwards. So, when you start designing a character, especially if you're looking at doing an action-adventure or a military-type comic, you're going to need to figure out exactly how two different characters fight and where all that armor and weapons are well-kept in a non-combat situation. And let's not forget that even if two characters have the exact same fighting style, the same weapons, the same armor, little differences between the two, obviously, are going to crop up. You know, if we have two characters with the exact same type of sword, well, one of them is going to be drawn a little bit lighter, the other one's going to be drawn a little bit darker. One of them is going to be drawn a little bit smoother, and the other one's going to have... Well, it's going to be a little bit edgier, you know, and it's not going to necessarily be all that smooth, if you know what I mean. One of them is going to be a little bit more symmetrical. One of them is going to have a thought built into it, you know. You're going to be able to tell a lot about the character's personality by what kind of weapons they wield. So, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get into it, shall we? Let's start off with good old-fashioned armor. Generally speaking, the less armor a character wears, the more expressive that character is going to be. Compare, say, Conan the Barbarian versus King Arthur. Conan has absolutely no problem letting you know how he feels. He has absolutely no problem letting his emotions run over him. And basically, you know exactly what Conan's thinking at any time. And if you don't have a clue, he's more than willing to tell you. This is opposed to, say, King Arthur, who's a lot more reserved, a lot stuffier. He's going to be thinking a little bit more, and he's not going to let his emotions run, you know, run wild with him. He's going to ha- he apparently has, as far as I can tell, ice water in his veins. 
gee, guess which one of these two runs around in pretty much nothing but a loincloth, and which one runs around in the thickest possible plate armor he can get his hands on. You know? Obviously, the more reserved person is in the plate mail, the less reserved person isn't. <laughs> and before you think that you can't really have an expressive person in plate mail, uh, compare to Lancelot. Anytime you see Lancelot, he's usually running around with his faceplate wide open. That visor is never down. You know? You can always see what Lancelot's thinking by his face, and he absolutely has no problem letting you know how he feels. That one little bit of exposure helps to define the difference between Lancelot and King Arthur. You know the two of them are really great friends, and they tend to share a lot in common, sometimes a little too much. You know, you can definitely tell there's a who's the more going to be the more fun person when it comes to a party, and the other person is going to be more of a stick in the mud. So, obviously, armor helps to define a lot about how we think about that person, even how they wear that armor. Generally speaking, when it comes to the actual character's fighting style, you're going to have three types. You're going to have wrestlers, you're going to have martial artists, you're going to have brawlers. The big difference between the three is that, well, the brawler is going to be somebody who really doesn't care about combat. They want to get into the combat and out of it as quickly as possible. They tend to be more of a lover than a fighter. I mean, it's just straight up. A brawler isn't really all that concerned about the, you know, exactly what's going on in the combat as long as they can survive it. That's all they're interested in. This is opposed to a martial artist who's a little bit more, well, let's just say a little bit more finesse. They take the combat very seriously. This is somebody who's going to be practicing their various moves and all that as much as they possibly can. And when I mean they're going to be more of a finesse fighter, we're talking pressure points. We're talking when they hit somebody, they know exactly where they're going to be hitting that person. Whereas the brawlers are going to be punching and hoping they hit, a martial artist will know exactly where they're hitting and exactly why they're hitting that person in that particular area. And then, of course, there's the wrestler, who's going to be a lot more bombastic than the other two. He's, you, If there's a wrestler in the area, you're going to know it because he's going to advertise. He's going to scream. He's going to yell. He's going to have body parts flying all over the part, place away from him. Ironically, of course, wrestlers tend to be the most serious about the combat because that's exactly their arena. Whereas a brawler is trying to get out of that area and the martial artist doesn't mind going into it, they'd prefer to be out of it, a wrestler is going to thrive in that area. On top of that, the, if you look at the brawler, it's going to be, shall we say, average size. The martial artist is going to be a little bit smaller than average because, well, they don't need to be. They don't need the bulk. On the other hand, they're also going to be tending to dressing a little bit more reservedly than everybody else. They're going to be interested in closing themselves off. Even if they were talking about somebody whose clothes tend to get ripped off a lot, yeah, they're going to start the combat as, with as much clothing as they possibly can. Wrestlers, on the other hand, yeah, they're, not in, they're definitely going to be shirtless from the beginning. In fact, the first thing they're going to do when they hit combat is rip that shirt off. So... You know, look at the different fighting styles. Look at how the character is going to present themselves into combat and look and go at it from there. And keep in mind, when we're talking martial arts, we're not necessarily talking somebody who's, you know, kung fu fighting or karate or anything like that. We're just looking at somebody who tends to approach combat in a lot more strategic style than, say, a wrestler who's going to be a lot more tactical. It doesn't have to be somebody who knows, say, mystical, magical martial art that nobody's ever heard of. It just has to be somebody who's more worried about where their lines blow. Like, sorry, where their blows land. You know? A uh, martial artist just tends to take much more care and tends to practice a lot more than, say, the wrestler who's going to be, you know, very of the moment. I hate going into stereotypes, but we're looking at the difference between a Viking warrior and a Shaolin monk. So, with, of course, a brawler just being somebody who's 
Captain Kirk. I mean, let's get real. Captain Kirk is not a very is not somebody who's very interested in staying in the middle of combat. He wants to get in. He wants to get out. So, just consider that when you start looking at the different personality types and trying to match them up with an overall fighting style. As far as the weapons themselves go, here's where things get really interesting. That is, with an overall fighting style, you tend to have a person who tends to have, you know, their general t- trips, their general tricks of the trade. On the other hand, we start looking at the various weapons. Well, you start getting into some very different psychologies. Consider swordsmen. We tend to look at swordsmen from two different degrees of, well, two different, you know, entirely differently different spears. That is, we tend to see swordsmen as not only dashing on one end, but we also tend to see them a little bit more barbaric on the other. You know, we look at Three Musketeers versus Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, I expect to see Conan be brought up a lot. He's just there. You know, when we start looking at swords, we tend to look at people who tend to know exactly what they're doing, go after it with a certain degree of precision, and usually there's some sort of level of honor there. Yeah, even with Conan, there's a certain level of honor. Conan will not, you know, there are certain things Conan will not do, and he has absolutely no problem telling you what these things are. He will not truck with mages, for example. You start throwing fireballs off, Conan starts targeting you. Just like when we have the Three Musketeers, we have a very definite, very strict honor code. This honor code doesn't have to be too strict, but generally speaking, people who have swords tend to have some sort of rules on their behavior. It's just part of the thing about swords. I, The long tradition, as soon as you start throwing tradition, you start throwing rules on it. Go figure. The other weapon we tend to associate a certain level of gentleman behavior, of course, is the pistol. I mean, you sort of have to. I mean, sure, you can have all these people who tend to be a little bit rough and rugged and have absolutely no problem doing using their firearm however they want, but those people also tend to have very short lifespans. You know, when you start having honor code, you have a certain level of expectation as far as the behavior goes, and because of that, you have two people who sort of respect that honor code. And, you know, that respect tends to put a different cast on a lot of different battles. We as writers really love that kind of thing because it gives us those really cool, dramatic moments. You know, if we had somebody who was just winning the battle and was doing nothing but the most amount of damage you possibly could... We're not going to get those really cool dramatic moments of will he or won't they. You throw a situation in where the person is actually thinking about how that their honor code affects their fighting. Hey, all of a sudden you get those really cool dramatic moments that let's get real. We love those little dramatic moments. Swords and pistols? Perfect. You know? Especially we're talking the older pistols where you actually have to, you know load and reload every shot and it's not exactly uh, you know a split second situation it's just straight up you start noticing when you start dealing with swords and pistols that you tend to have a definite honor code involved it's just something that fighters tend to like and tend to abuse I mean let's get real we tend to like all those rules regarding dueling it tends to have some adds a little bit of flavor to it adds a little bit of drama and makes it a little bit more interesting. And these are pretty much the two biggest weapons when it comes to that. On the other extreme, you've got, well, the sniper rifle. Whereas the other two tend to be very emotional, the sniper rifle obviously is going to be very cold, very distant. That is, that person isn't going to be thinking in terms of how their honor code goes into the situation. That person is going to be worried about getting the job done and making sure he doesn't get caught. That's why the snipers tend to be a little bit more... When they deal with something, they're going to go for that one shot's going to be maximum damage. And it's not necessarily going to be 
you know, just killing one person. It's going to be killing a very specific individual. Snipers tend to be very cold, very methodical. And that's all sorts of cool. Just look at, you really want to see a fun character when it comes to snipers? Check out GoGo13. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff that he does, and when you start looking at those particular comics, you get to feel exactly what a sniper is all about. And we're talking some really cool stuff. We're talking how far he has to calculate things in order to make sure his shot hits exactly where he wants. He's actually famous for doing a 110 degree shot. Yeah, think about that for a sec. Because he bounces it right off a bell. So he has to know exactly when the bell is not moving. He needs to allow for the wind speed. He needs to allow for how fast his bull is going to be going. So on and so forth. The sniper is only going to get one shot and he has to make that shot count. So they tend to be a lot more cold or a lot more methodical than the other characters tend to be. Well, if the sniper happens to be the most methodical warrior when it comes down to it, at the other end of this particular spectrum, you're going to have the axe wielder. Yeah, we're talking typified by your average Viking berserker. Ideally, we're talking somebody who's going to go into battle swinging, and he's not really going to be caring about too much about being methodical or even tactical. This is a person who's going to want to go into battle, get it over with, and make it a point that you do not engage in battle with him afterwards. You know? The, you're going to find that the actualers tend to be very serious about combat, even if they tend to lose it there. They tend to take a very basic, you're in the line of fire, you're going to go down. It doesn't matter who or what you are. You're a target, and they will eliminate all targets when possible. They tend to take the combat extremely deadly seriously. At the same time, of course, they're also the least amount, the least worried about personal safety. A berserker gets into combat, lets the axe fly. They're not worried about coming out alive. They've resigned themselves to the fight fate, and they don't really care if they come out of it alive or not, as long as they basically did whatever they were trying to be, accomplish. So, yeah, they tend to be very emotional, but they also tend to be very serious. Go figure. And then, of course, you have your dagger wielders. Generally speaking, if somebody has a dagger, a garrot, or a sap, you know, one of those so-called assassin weapons, yeah, we're basically looking at somebody who's very sneaky, who's going to be able to calculate which moment is the best for them to strike and for them to do the most damage, while at the same time not taking any damage themselves. We're talking to people who tend to prefer to, shall we say, strike from the shadows. Strike from the rear. Strike from the shadows in the rear if they possibly can. The extreme example of this, obviously, is your average sneak thief, you know? They're going to go into a situation. They're going to assess if the person they want it can be killed or not. And if they can, hey, they'll go for it. You also have, of course, the buggy cult from India that was infamous for, you know, getting everybody to come into for a meal and then when they got everybody there, they took the, the people to death. They were not very subtle about what they did, but very sneaky about it. Go figure. The bottom line is, when we start looking at daggers or saps or, you know, even garrots, we're looking at weapons that need to be set up in ambush and then capitalized on. These people we do not trust. If we see you have a bandolier of daggers, yeah, you're not exactly going to be dressed in white, usually. And if you are dressed in white, it's a lie. The white is a lie. We do not trust people with daggers, for usually very good reason. Just ask Caesar. Another broad category of weapons that we tend to look at with you know obvious stereotypes are martial arts weapons. Generally speaking, we're talking a broad range of weapons that tend to be a little bit more on the, shall we say, esoteric side, you know. We're looking at your hook swords. We're looking at nunchucks. We're looking at three-piece rods. We're looking at the so-called egg, uh, which is basically a, literally, egg-shaped piece of metal on a chain. 
We're looking at all your various ninja weapons. The bottom line is, is that we're looking at the weapons that are not usually something you'd see in combat, but these people tend to wield with a high degree of skill. When we start looking at martial artists, we, especially when it turns to these particular weapons, we're looking at people who are very precise. You know, they don't just slash, they, after, you know, seem hoping they can hit, when they slash at you or stab you or whatever, they're going for very specific body parts. They also tend to be a little bit more graceful. That is, there's a lot of economy of movement. They just don't, you know, run into battle. They tend to basically, well, there's a depth, you know, they tend to move and they tend to know exactly how they're going to move. And they tend to approach combat to a certain degree as a chess match. It's sort of interesting to watch, say, a person going with nunchucks versus, say, versus a person with a battle axe. You've got somebody who's very straightforward in their combat versus somebody who has to be a little bit more, you know, thinking about repercussions on it. And it sort of makes an entirely different battle. Even when you start seeing these big, huge line battles of peasants going after each other, they're realizing that Whoever wins is going to basically probably go out and try to kill as many of the losers as possible. It's pretty much a, you know, win or lose situation. So yeah, the martial artists also tend to take their combat very seriously. But they're also tending to look at it as a chess match and, you know, it's not just simply a nunchuck versus hook toward situation. It's a who can do the best damage and who can look the best doing it, which is sort of a weird way of looking at it. But, you know, generally speaking, a martial arts going to worry about the fight after the battle. And yeah, there's going to be a fight of some sort after any battle and towards figure out exactly who won. And it can get really interesting, really weird, really quick. It's not just about flip kicks and, you know, flying across the battlefield in a single jump. They have to worry about what's going to have, how to secure the fight after the battle. That's something a lot of other fighters tend not to worry about. On top of that, we know that the various weapons also help to further define the martial artist's personality. Uh, just look at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And yeah, we're looking at the comic more than we are looking at the cartoon. Mainly because in the comic, everybody wore a red mask. You had to look at whatever the personality was based on when the weapon the person was wielding. And so, you've got somebody who's a little bit more, well, honorable. You've got somebody who's very aggressive. And you've got somebody who tends to think a little bit more about how to survive the battle. And you've got somebody who's going to go into it and be prepared for it. So... The very weapon that martial arts use is going to tell you a lot about the personality of that person as well. Yeah, I know, additional writer stuff, but it can get fun. One martial arts weapon that we need to look very closely at is, of course, the staff. That is, when people see somebody with a staff, they tend to look at, say, the wise man of the group. Or, in fantasy realms, we tend to look at the mage. In essence, somebody who's wielding a staff is somebody who's probably going to have to be a little bit smarter or a little bit wiser than anybody around him. Generally speaking, there are plenty of exceptions. The general rule, however, is that people who tend to wield staffs tend to be a little bit more... just tend to be a little bit smarter and tend to be a little bit more perceptive of the overall situation. Even when they tend to get right in the middle of combat, they're still looking at it in terms of where they need to be and where everybody else needs to be around them. Because of this, we've associated... I mean, it's just straight up. When we start looking at stereotypes we've attached to weapons, we tend to look at whoever has the biggest brain is most likely going to have the biggest staff, which is an interesting statement in and of itself. But we'll let that one slide for now. The bottom line is, is that when we start looking at intelligent character, that character is going to wield some sort of staff usually. And this applies just as much to comic books as it does to fantasy as it does to pretty much anything else. You know, if you start looking at the various Robins, you notice that some of them, you notice that Nightwing 
Tinsley World of Staff as well as um, as well as Tim Drake. These are also the two smartest of the Batman protégés. It's just straight up. The staff generally represents some sort of intelligence and also is most likely to have some sort of magical power attached to it. And this applies just as much to... I mean, just look at some of the biblical examples, for example. You've got Joshua puts his staff down and you know the sun stops. You've also got Moses and the various magicians who all go staff to staff, which isn't quite accurate because their staffs turn into snakes and Moses... Staff eats all the rest of the snakes and turns back into a regular staff. And yeah, the Bible gets weird. The bottom line is is that out of all the various weapons, the one most associated with the straight intelligence is usually the staff. Keep that in mind and it'll make things a lot more interesting for your characters. Strictly as a side note, this is why anytime a gamer sees somebody with a staff, that's the person they target. Once you take out the person with a staff, you've taken out the mage. And you take care of a lot of firepower when you take out the mage. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a gaming thing. I play way too much D&D. Leave me alone. Another weapon we have a lot of stereotypes attached to is, of course, the dreaded club. We tend to look at people who use clubs as, well, a little more primitive than everybody else. We tend to look at them as a little bit rougher around the edges, shall we say. Generally speaking, if you're wielding a club in the battle, yeah, you're going to be basically looking at the big giant who who ripped a tree out of the ground, or the Etten who's got a club in both fists, or even the caveman, you know? When we start looking at somebody with a club, we're not looking at somebody who's going into battle expecting to basically come out of it. On the other hand, the, the person with a club isn't necessarily as serious as anybody else with anything. In this case, I don't mean you know, you're treating the combat as a joke. It's just that the club is such a simple weapon it's just that you tend to not take those people as seriously as you would other combatants. There's just not a whole lot you can do with a straight club. Yeah, I know I've got martial artists who are going to disagree with me left and right on that. It's just straight up. When you start seeing somebody with a club, you're expecting somebody who's in the swinging. You're not talking to somebody who's going to be worrying about pairing. Or, for that matter, anything of any of an incredible tactical nature. They're just going to be going into the situation and hoping they come out. So, you know, we just don't associate the club with having a whole lot of finesse about it. And so if you're trying to have a character who's not a finesse character... Give them a club, and there's a lot of variations on the club. Baseball bats, you know, two by fours. The club is a great default weapon. And if you want to basically show that your big, huge, ultra skilled martial artist just said screw it, yeah, send him into battle with a two by four. If you want to feel better about it, throw some nails at the end. But the bottom line is that when you see somebody with a club, the stereotype is this is not a finesse person. This is somebody who's, either, who's getting down the who's getting down the business and just going after it and is just going to not be a fun person to be around during combat. So, just something to consider when you start throwing around some interesting stereotypes. And if you really want to see some stereotypes, consider the whip. The problem with the whip is that it has to be a precision weapon. You know? It's not really doing a whole lot of damage compared to other weapons, and it's more of a weapon to entangle person people with. It takes people out of combat, sure, but it's not taking them out of combat in the same way that, say, a sword through the gut is. They have to tangle the person up just to be effective. Because of that, we tend to associate the whip with somebody who's in control of the situation, or at least is trying to maintain control of the situation, and is expecting that level of control to actually be their their armor. And when you start looking at who wills the whip, yeah, there's a certain level of fetishization going on there as well. You know, let's look at, say, Catwoman. You expect somebody very sexy, and... She usually delivers. I mean, it's just... 
there's a lot of symbolism behind the whip, and it's not necessarily some good stuff. Because we also tend to associate the whip with slavery. You know, we tend to look at people who are sadistic, overbearing, who need to be in control, and that level of control has poisoned them. And they tend to have whips. On the flip side, we also have people who tend to be very sexy and very controlling. Also tend to be whip users. Suffice to say, it can get really confusing. The bottom line is, is that when somebody has a whip, it's definitely a control situation. We just have to basically figure out if we want that control to be good or bad. And that decision can definitely change our perception of that particular character. The pole arm can be another fun weapon. In essence, we're looking at something that's usually customarily 8 to 14 feet long with something pointing at the other end of it. The problem with the pole arm is that is really great in terms of setting it for, to receive a charge. It's also something that tends to be very good at helping other people around you because it has a definite reach to it. You know, when you start seeing someone with a pole arm, not only does this person mean business, but this person is trying to do business from a distance as much as they can with what is essentially is a melee weapon. This is also something you tend to see in a lot of mercenaries, especially if we happen to go back historically. Uh, generally speaking, the best people to have a pole arm use were the Swiss. And at the time, well, the Swiss were considered some of the best mercs out there. So when you see somebody with a pole arm, yeah, you're not only looking at somebody who's very good at team tactics, but you're also basically looking at somebody who's going to do whatever it takes to get into and out of battle. And if it happens to be killing you, so be it. Pole arm people are not very nice. They have to be cruel, because let's get real. Once you get within a certain range of that pole arm, it becomes basically just a very long staff. And a very unwieldy one at that. So they've got to keep you at a distance if at all possible. That means they have to be very good, very bloody. Very nasty people, pulling people are. You've also got bows and arrows. As opposed to... The bow and arrow combines pretty much all the things you see with the pistols, with everything you see with a sniper rifle. That is, you've got somebody who has to be very strategic in terms of who they shoot... But there's also a definite code of honor there. It's just straight up, generally speaking, when you've got a bow and arrow, you're tending to basically be some of the nicer people. You know, it's not like you're trying to be a total jerk about it. You're trying to basically get your job done and get back to work. There's a reason that bows are seen as usually, and I do mean usually, the peasant weapon. You have some odd, when we start hitting the exceptions, we start looking at the samurai, but let's get real. In order to have a bow, you have to have a certain degree of craftsmanship. It's not something you can just simply go out, grab from the field. You've actually got to carve it. You've got to have a very specific uh, requirements as far as that wood goes. You've got to have a piece of sinew that goes from point A to point B. The bottom line is that there's a lot of crap that goes into having a proper bow. Because of that, you tend to see them either with people who tend to do a lot of wood carving, which would be the European peasantry, or you tend to see them with people who can afford an artisan to go after the bow, the samurai. Sort of an interesting situation there. However, the bottom line is, is that you tend to see them with people who basically, I hate saying... This is going to be definitely one of the weirder weapons. I mean, on one hand, you've got... There's a definite code of honor there. I mean, it's just straight up. There has to be. You're not talking a weapon that's going to be fired as often as possible. And when it is, we're looking at... You know, almost a solid minute can go between strikes. There has to be some sort of established turn order. Or at least some sort of honor between archers. Otherwise... Things get very bloody very quickly. I mean, I mean, bloodier than they were. Just ask the Knights of Agincourt. So, and of course, the same applies to a crossbow. Of course, with a crossbow, you've got the situation that, at that point, people are trying to get the battle over as quickly as possible. And so we've got a lot of different types of crossbows. And in all honesty, with the crossbow, if you want to make an interesting point about psychology and the size of the weapon... This is your weapon. 
generally speaking, and not necessarily the way you think you perverts. The hand crossbow, for example, is tended to be used by assassins. It can be snuck in, does its damage, and the person can sneak right back out. This is opposed to the hunter's the heavy crossbow, which requires a little bit more finesse. Not much more because let's get real, the crossbow is known for doing damage. And then of course you have the dreaded repeating crossbow. Yeah, there's a repeating crossbow. It's a gravity feet fed situation. The entire concept is that you're basically you know you've got a mechanism that will keep taking the the string, cock it back, dropping it coral into the situation to fire the coral. And this can be repeated. The only problem, of course, obviously, is that it's not a precision item. But it's also an item that tends to be used by the peasantry. They're easy to make. The concept's not that hard to figure out. And it's just something you're going to be seeing in, in peasant battles. You know, you want to talk, like I said, you want to talk about psychology based on size? Yeah, crossbow is your friend. The repeating crossbow brings up another interesting point, and something worth noting, especially as a writer or an artist, when it comes down to exactly how you're designing a weapon. The repeating crossbow is designed to basically be a very cheap, very easy-to-build weapon. That is, it's made out of the cheapest possible materials in the area. And think about that for a sec. When it comes down to the various weapons, you can have a lot said about the character based on the materials that the weapon is made out of. When we're looking at the repeating crossbow, again, it's a very obviously a peasant's weapon. It's designed to be simple, it's supposed to be rough, you know, something you can do in an afternoon type of deal. That's exactly as fine. But that roughness says a lot about the person who wields that weapon as well. And that's uh, something that needs to be noted when it comes to the artistic value of any particular weapon. The more care you put into the weapon, obviously the more serious a warrior you are. And that applies to not only the weapons you use, but you yourself. Again, notice the difference between, say, the wrestler and the martial artist. The martial artist puts a lot more time into practice than the wrestler does. And that applies just as much, you know, with a sumo wrestler as it does a regular a Greek wrestler. This isn't trying to cast dispersions onto the sumo. Trust me, I have full respect for those guys. Just observing that, whereas the monk is going to be more interested in you know spending hours at a time honing a very specific, precise punch, the sumo is going to be more interested in trying to build up the bulk. And that means not just generally eating, but also means you know hitting the gym. Two entirely different philosophies. It's worth that training is the major difference, those that we're sort of looking at here. And the same applies to the weapons they tend to use as well. You know, if you spend an afternoon making your weapon versus an entire week making sure everything's right, all the balances are right, it's got the mask of steel thing going on, so on and so forth, that is, you're putting some actual care into that weapon. That weapon is going to tend to be a lot scarier than something you put into an afternoon's worth of work into. You know what I mean? So that's something you also need to worry about as a writer as well as an artist. Just to what degree difference is have you put into the weapon and what kind of detail is that going to mean for the weapon in general? Yeah, yeah, I watch way too much Forge in the Fire, leave me alone. Overall, you know, it's just something to consider. And that also applies to the materials as well. Obviously, in some situations, you're not going to have much of a choice, you know. If you're out on a desert island, you can actually do a club. You're going to be limited to clubs and bows and arrows. That's fine. You know, it's just when you take those stuff back to civilization and you're still using the bow and arrow that you use from the desert island, yeah, you're going to be looked at sort of strange. Yeah, that's a really cool favorite weapon. But let's get real. Even Green Arrow stopped using his the island bow once he got back to civilization. And yeah, I know I'm 
ultra simplifying it. But again, I'm trying to basically set this up because I want you to get the idea that whatever fighting style, whatever you use to fight, is going to help define that person's character, this characterization. Of course, the writers or the artists are going to end up hating you, especially if you get into some really incredibly detailed weapons. But that's them. You as a writer need to figure out exactly what the best weapon, the best fighting style, how this person thinks in combat in order to get fully get into the person's head. Because that you're going to be wanting to look at the armor, you're going to look at the fighting style, you're going to look at the weapons. You're going to talk to the artist about how they hold these weapons, how they carry these weapons. There's a lot of really cool things that when you start getting into the various weapons and their histories and their traditions and so on and so forth, that just gets all sorts of cool. And those added levels of detail can only help your story. Anything that helps immerse you into these characters, it helps you get you into whatever thinking thoughts that these characters are into, can only help. Don't take too much time about this, by the way. If you end up spending a couple of weeks per character setting everything up just perfect, yeah, that's going to be just... I appreciate the attention to detail, but that's just a way too much, you know? You're going to be spending way too much time trying to set things up and not enough time writing. And if you want to see the easiest way to tick off an artist, it's spend a couple of weeks getting a page of work to them. You know what I mean? The only way you can tick off an artist more is if you do an army scene every page. And I'm not talking just a close in of what's going on in battle. I'm talking like 600 warriors one panel. Yeah. There's a reason a lot of artist teams don't tend to work and why a lot of artists tend to go, end up in jail. I'm sure this has absolutely nothing to do with it. Just that you as a writer need to realize that anything you can do to make things a little bit more solidified to yourself works. Obviously, don't take too much time doing it, but anything that you can that helps you build up a more real universe for yourself is going to be reflected on you, and your readers are going to catch on to this. They're going to be starting to look for details. You know, it's why some people don't mind pouring over Lord of the Rings 27 zillion times. There's a lot of incredible details left to unpack there. And this is also why a lot of people go through the Marvel Universe movies you know, looking for those little Easter eggs. They know they're there. So, have fun with it. See what details you can come up with. Figure out what traditions you can set up behind your weapons. And, yeah, weapons with a story are really fun in and of themselves. Just look at Excalibur. Heck, um, look at monkeys. Yeah, the staff he uses is a really simple little staff when it comes down to it. But this is also a staff that was used originally to flatten the Milky Way galaxy. It's a nice little touch, and it adds a lot more to our appreciation of Monkey. Yeah, Journey into the West is an incredible book. You need to read it. So, if there's anything you take away from this, it's make sure that whenever details you throw in work to build up the character and have a lot more fun and allow you to have some fun with the character. You know, how the character fights should not be something you overlook and treat as an insignificant detail to the last very minute. This is something you need to build into the character and actually have some fun with it from the get-go. So, build your characters. Build them wisely. Have fun when you build them. Don't put too much detail into them or your artist will shoot you. But have some fun with it. Just figure out how your characters work and you'll figure out a lot more about they'll just be able to build them themselves. Trust me, I have conversations with characters all the time based on little details like this. I'm perfectly sane, usually. Anyway, have some fun with it. I'll talk to you later. And if you like this podcast, please support us by going to patreon.com slash two sparrows T-W-O We have plenty of lots of fun stuff like this all over the place there tips and tricks you wouldn't believe We even have a few extra, little extras I'll talk to you later, have a good evening